next in a series of classic stories. DreamWorks Home Entertainment invites you on an all-new animated adventure. The film critics call epic and grand. Storytelling at its best. A story that will live forever. Tell Pharaoh about my gift, please. I'm told you merely need to hear a dream. You can explain it. That is true. Believe in the miracle of dreams. DreamWorks Home Entertainment presents the classic story of one man and his incredible gift. Joseph, King of Dreams. Own the film the entire family can enjoy. All right. Well, hello, everybody. I hope everybody's doing fantastic today. Um, I know I'm having a pretty, I'm having a pretty decent day. I'm not gonna lie. It's been good. It's been good. So hopefully it's been good for all of you too. Um, I know that it took a while to get to them last week. So I am purposefully going to go ahead and hit them right now. Um, so give me one second. We're going to do uh, super chats or donations rather. So Raj Williams for five Canadian. Thank you so much. Raj says another great animated movie choice. Lady G great soundtrack and visuals. The story of course was, and still is epic smiley face. Thank you, Raj. Yes. This is one of my favorites. Um, it, it's interesting because the casting the, the casting for this movie is also there's a ton of talent on this bench. Ben Affleck um, voices uh, Joseph and we get um, Mark Hamill is in this as well. Um, he actually is the voice of Judah, the brother. Um, and we get... Um, Maureen McGovern is in here. Um, David Campbell. I'm trying to think who else. Um, David Campbell is the singing voice for Joseph. Um, ben Affleck, I think, sang one song, but um, ultimately decided to let David be the singing voice. Um, Richard Hurd is in this too, uh, is on the bench. So there's... There's quite a bit of, quite a bit of uh, talent on this bench. So it's really nice to see that. Um, yeah, like when I realized that, because when I first watched this movie, I was like, man, that voice sounds really familiar. And then, then I realized that it was Ben Affleck. And I was like, oh my gosh, we got Val Kilmer for Moses and Ben Affleck for Joseph. All right. Um, I will say, I think the, uh, mm, you know what? If you give me a minute, let me just quadruple check. Um, but if I remember correctly, um, this this film did not have quite the same budget that um, Prince of Egypt did. It was a little bit smaller of a budget. Um, not that, you know, Richard Hurd, Mark Hamill, and Ben Affleck aren't friggin', you know, worth it um but i i don't think um i don't think that they had quite the same animated budget that um prince of egypt did but it was still it's it's a fantastic film um so the the songs are are great the story is timeless um and they do a very good job of adapting it and and is they they were <laughs> i don't know why you wouldn't respect the source material when the source material is the bible um but they they did a really really good job of 
of for this adaptation. It's it's enjoyable. Anybody can watch it. It's it's a good time. Um, so yes, I'm glad you're looking forward to it, Raj. Um, Bastard for five dollars says, "Curious why you decided on a month of animation instead of military films for Memorial Day, Jarhead." Well, Bastard, if you go back to November, you'll know I did military movies for Veterans Day. So there's that. But also because an animated, the animated movie month of May just sort of like rolled off the tongue, and I don't know, I really liked it. Plus, for some reason. Animated films get a really bad rap. They're like, oh, they're just for kids. They're not that good. Um, there's, there's nothing like you know. I, I'm, I, I don't watch. I don't watch animated films. Are you kidding? I'm too old for that. Um, and I, I just, I think, um, especially like the films that we've gone through, and especially like, and I'm gonna, I still have to go through honorable mentions as well. Um, I think it, I I think it really truly shows that you can enjoy animated films if they're done correctly, um, no matter your age. And that just because they're animated, uh, does not necessarily mean that they are only for kids. I, I know that for a long time that I, and that mentality is still pretty strong, but for a long time it was, oh, you're 12 years old, you can't be watching animated films anymore. And I'm not even talking about anime. I'm just talking about like animated films. Um, And I always thought that that was really ridiculous because the medium that a film presents itself in does not necessarily um, mean that it's for a specific demographic. Now, granted, most kids' movies are animated because the bright colors and the motions and everything, it captures children's attention, which, if any of you have kids, know is dang near impossible. So it makes sense that it would be colorful and bright and musical and catchy. That would all make a lot of sense. Um, but you're not you're not strictly, like, bound to that. Um and so I think it's I, I think it's really helpful to remember um, that just because you're a certain age doesn't mean that you're not allowed to watch certain things as you grow older. Obviously, when you're younger, like if you're five, you probably shouldn't be going into say Jaws or something, unless you're Steeg, in which case I don't know that that man <sighs> he's a different breed. <laughs> for for sure a different breed um but i think i don't know um there was there's something about i guess the way The, just, I don't know, the way that they tell the story. Sorry, I was like trying, my brain was trying to catch up with me. There's something about the way that they tell the story. Particularly, like, I think, you know, out of out of the weeks that we've done um, the animated films, you know, only one film has not been from... Uh, Oh gosh, my my brain blinked. Ah, Universal. Um, so I I don't know. Like I said, or DreamWorks. Sorry, not because DreamWorks acquired you know, or Universal required DreamWorks. That's why. Anyway, so I don't know why DreamWorks ever got off this um, path, this particular path. I think that they did themselves a disservice. They were definitely. Um, there was definitely a lot still left here, um, for them to explore. And I think that they would have been an absolute juggernaut to this day. Um, so it, it's really, it's really interesting when you think of like, were they trying to follow Disney because Disney was getting out of, you know, they made the announcement 
that they were getting out of um, classic animation and the last classic, an like I said, the last classic animated film we got from Disney that was solely classically animated was the, um, uh, the Princess and the Frog. And I, I really do think that that's a disservice because I'm not, there's something magical about 2D animation. And you saw it like the night, the Disney would not be what it, I don't care what anybody says. Disney would not be who or what they are without the nineties Renaissance classic animation. It just, they simply would not be where they are. I mean, their entire park is basically built around it. And of course the original three, which were Snow White, Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella. So for, for people to be like, oh, you know, classic animation is outdated. It's, it's lame. It's, you know, whatever, um, term terminology that they want to try and use. It's really disingenuous to say that because you've got, I don't know, you, you have a whole empire that was built on the back of hand-drawn, classic 2D animation. You know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's just, it's something that baffles my mind because I know that pretty much everybody that I taught, like, you talk to anybody and they're like, oh, you know, my favorite is the Jungle Book or, um the Aristocats or the Black Cauldron or, you know, maybe they will hit the classics and they'll be like, oh, Aladdin is my favorite or um, Sleeping Beauty or um, Beauty and the Beast, whatever it might be, you know? And so the, you have, I, I, I really truly think that um, the, that classic animation for whatever reason has, has gotten a really, a really, a, a really bad name for just like, oh, it's just, it's for little kids. We don't want to watch it. And then like people seem to forget that there's a trillion dollar industry built around it. You know what I mean? Um, and quite frankly, I just miss it. I, I miss, I miss that, I don't know, spark? There's definitely something like the, there's there's just something that 2D animation captures that 3D animation simply can't. And I don't know what that is. I wish that I did. But yes, yes, Charlie Stevenson, technology doesn't replace artistic talent and imagination. Exactly. Like, that's my point. I, I don't I don't know what it is that gets captured by the 2D animation so perfectly but it, it, it really does. So now that we've sort of gone down that memory, I, I hope, Bastard, I hope you got your money's worth. Um, Cal G for $3 says, Miracle Child, instant classic for me. Oh, I love that song. I absolutely love that song. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, perhaps, with the story of Joseph and um, his gift, basically, he was... Uh, his father married um, Rachel, another woman. So he'd already had um, 12 sons. Um, he'd already had his sons with um, previously, and they were all older. And then Rachel wasn't supposed to be able to have children. So when she became pregnant with Joseph, they were like, oh, he's a miracle child. He's, he's touched by God. Um, you know, he's going to be different than his brothers. He's going to be different than his siblings. We're going to, um, raise him differently. His, while his brothers and labors in the field, there's a line in the film actually, um, where, um, his father says, you know, I worked this earth my whole life, just like it, just like my, um, fathers and grandfathers before me and like your brothers will after me. And he's like, but that won't be your future. And Joseph is like, why? And because he's like, because you are a miracle child. And he's like, I don't want to be different, right? The oh, the burden of, of being different. 
So um, it's, you know, that's his mom right there. And she sewed him this coat of many colors. And of course, his brothers don't have anything this nice. And his brothers are, they're, they're really tanned. Um, they're, you know, they've got calluses on their hands and their feet. Um, their skin, and like they make a point in this scene particularly where, yeah, Joseph is, you know, he's, he's by no means like super fair skinned, but like when you compare him to his brothers who've been out pretty much every single day of their entire lives, um, out in the sun doing really hard labor, um, it's kind of not even really a comparison. And it's, oh, hey, Laish, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, lurk away. Um, yes, Raj, they really laid it on thick with the Miracle Child. Um, you know, they, the whole song is, is about how he's different and how he's special and he's smart and he's somehow set apart. Those are literal lyrics. Um, and then he's like, petty rules and limitations don't apply. And his brothers get really, really jealous of him. And one night he has this dream and... Um, you kind of saw a little bit of it in the trailer, but so his dreams kind of look like a Van Gogh paint, like they look like a painting, right? Um, so that you can sort of tell, you can tell the difference. This is something that also 2D animation is just so fantastic for because you can really tell when he's in the dream world because the technique and the type of animation that we're in, it's very, it's very otherworldly. And you can tell that this isn't like, you're seeing what Joseph is seeing, but you're realizing that this isn't actually happening right now. And this becomes really important because Joseph dreams that he goes out in the field and the wolves kill the ram. And Joseph wakes up and he's like, oh my gosh. And But he looks out and the ram is fine. Well, then later that day, um, Joseph goes out in the field with his brothers and then his brothers are like, hey, while well, we go round up the strays, can you keep an eye on the herd for us? And he's like, sure, no problem. And... Um, so Judah, the oldest, is like, yeah, here you go. And um, so he is going to sit there and watch the herd while they go round up the strays. Well, of course, his brothers have ditched him and they went to go swimming. Um, and then a wolf attacks. And so Joseph does his best, but he's not a seasoned shepherd. He can't really do anything against these wolves. And then his dad and then their father shows up. And so when their father shows up, who is a seasoned uh, shepherd, of course, he gets he he scatters the wolves, but the brothers are nowhere to be found. And Joseph is trying not to narc on him, but he's also not a very good liar. Um, so when <laughs> when they come running up the hill, Joseph's like they went swimming. And of course, his father's furious and it causes another fight. Um, but then Joseph notices that the ram is dead. And then that's when his father's like, oh, I understand. God sent you a vision of the future. And the brothers are like, he didn't really see the future, right? And Judah doesn't know what to make of it because it is exactly like Joseph's dream. Um, then Joseph has another dream, which I couldn't find in here anywhere, which I was pretty stunned about. But Joseph has another dream. And basically what happens is he's working with his brothers in the field and then they're all carrying sheaves of wheat and then the wheat oh there's the brother swimming haha <laughs> this is right before the wolves attack they're having a gay good old time playing oh i know what that's called not chicken i know what that's called um anyway so yeah they're having fun in the water because you know they work hard or whatever but then joseph points out he's like you're not tired because you got up early you're tired because you were out all night and then joseph is like yeah i know all about the women and the drinking and the staying out way too late um and so the brothers who are all unmarried they're like they're like don't you dare tell father i'll wring your skinny neck so they don't like him right and now he's got dirt on them so they're like they, they threaten him because they don't want to get in trouble. Um, but yeah, here's another shot of, it's a gif actually, which is great. Um, this is, you know, his dream within a dream. So like he, it doesn't even really appear like he's moving. It's more like the landscape is moving around him. So the, the, the mastery that was done with 
um, this film is just fantastic. Um, but Joseph has this other dream and the stars and the sheaves of wheat and the brothers are all bowing to him. And <laughs> you can imagine the brothers are not a big fan of that. Like, they're not too crazy about having to bow to their spoiled little brother who has never worked a day in their in his life, according to them. Now, granted, he was learning languages and scrolls and mathematics and all these other things, so he was working, it just wasn't the same kind of work. Um, so after the brothers get into a fight, uh, he talks to his mom, and his mom is like, he goes, she's like, you know, they're your brothers, you need to try and make amends. Um, all we have is family. And so he's like, okay, I'm going to go try and make this up to my brothers. Well, ah, forbidden. Oh guys, it was forbidden. Um, so <laughs> he gets thrown that the brothers don't believe him and they throw him or they back him rather. They back him up into, um, a, a ravine. And then because they're such good big brothers, they sell him into slavery. Rather than just going to their father and being like, hey, we were roughhousing with Joseph and he fell and hurt himself and this, that, and the other. Nope. They figure the best, the best thing to do is just sell their little brother into slavery. And granted, a lot of it had to do with jealousy. You know, they were envious of him. They were wrathful. All the bad things. All the bad things. Um, and yeah, so now Joseph gets sold into slavery. And um, he goes, oops, he gets to, when they get to the market, um, it's, it doesn't, like, it doesn't go very well for him. He, they try to sell him and, and master, like all these masters are coming up and they're checking his teeth and they're checking his weight and, and all of the stuff that, um, you know, the, to, to see basically kind of like he's a horse or something to see how healthy he is and how much work they can put on him without him breaking essentially. Well, um, the captain of the guard for a rather powerful man um looks at him and he goes mm, this one right here so he's like 30 pieces of silver and it's it's really um interesting because he is he is also a slave but he is like an elevated slave he was you know loyal enough and was um he did it he he brought enough honor to the house of potiphar that he is now able to hold some type of authority. Um, so he's like 30 pieces. Yeah. He looked, because like, if you look at everybody else, they're all, they're old or they're skinny or they're sick or they're weak. Um, so he looks at him and he goes, yeah, he seems healthy enough. Um, because they don't want to bring any sickness into their household. Yes, exactly. Anonymous. They got to check the product. Right. So he goes ahead and he's like, all right, well, I guess we're going to do this now. Um, and so they're in Egypt. He gets sold to um, an Egyptian master whose name is Potiphar. That's him in the background. And he actually does really well for Potiphar. Um, because of the education that his father gave him, he is able to prevent Potiphar from being cheated um, out, of a, out of extra money when it comes to the purchase of a horse. So... Um, right here is where this is right after joseph saves potiphar from being from, from, from having uh i guess like his wealth stolen from like being embarrassed by the fact that he was tricked by a horse thief or a, a thief in general not even a horse thief um and so he's like what else can you do and then potiphar starts giving joseph because joseph had been potiphar's wife uh, assistant. He, what ended up happening, he did a really good job doing basic slave work. And she was like, oh, he's a hard worker. Let's put him to better use in the banquet hall. This, by the way, remember this, because this woman is a problem. This woman becomes a problem. He, she did not care that he was a hard worker. I mean, yeah, it helped, but 
she didn't care about that. She was attracted to Joseph. She wanted to have him around to look at, basically. Um, but then Pot when he saves Potiphar from um, the theft, from, from overpaying for the horse, he takes Joseph as his personal slave. And so his wife can't do or say anything about it. Um, so she just sort of, like, lets it go and watches from afar or whatever. But he, like, cleans up. Potiphar's household. He helps with hieroglyphics, with translations, with scroll work, um, with all kinds of things. Uh, he helps irrigate some of the crops. Um, he, he basically invents a scarecrow, essentially. Um, I think I saw it. One sec. Yeah, right here. He puts up the scarecrow. Um, he uses this old, he uses this old, uh, ox head, this gold ox head, and he makes it appear like there's someone in the fields and then the grapes grow to the best they've ever been in, in years. And they have one of the best yields ever. So Joseph is bringing in a lot of value for Potiphar. He's, he's doing really good things for this man. Well, because it wouldn't be a story without drama. Um, one night Potiphar's wife, comes to Joseph's room and wakes him up out of a dead sleep. He's having a nightmare. His brothers are laughing at him, teasing him. Um, and, you know, she shows up and he, and she's like, Joseph. And he goes, huh? And she's like, shh. So you already know it ain't good. Like, she's not there for good reasons. Well, he, she's like, tell me more about Canaan and your family. And he goes, he's like, this is my mother and my father. This is Canaan. These are the sunflowers my mother planted. And he goes, and she, he's like, my brothers, they betrayed me. And she tries to like pretend to try and comfort him. She's like, where are your family now? And she's like, we care for you. She's like, I think you're special. And, like, makes the moves on him. And he's like, no, I will not betray my master. And she's like, she's like, but I want this. And here it is. Yeah. So she shows up and he's, and is like, tell me about these, maybe. Look, black screen. Um, all right. There we go. Uh, and she's like, tell me more about your family. So he's showing her the, um, the wall of hieroglyphics that he made. Um, and, you know, she's like getting really close, talking to him. Well, then she claims that, so she screams, he runs away. She rips his clothing. Um, so he's got a torn, <sighs> God dang it. So I don't know if you guys can really see it, but he has a torn outfit. His wife, but Potiphar's wife is over here crying, saying that, he did terrible things. And again, because this is a kid's film, they don't, like, it's alluded to that um, he attacked, like, you know, he attacked uh, Potiphar's wife. And at one point, this point right here, where you saw her crying before, he's like, am I to believe a slave over my own wife? And so he's going to put Joseph to death right there in front of her. And, and Joseph's like, help me, please. I'm begging you. Like, tell him I didn't do anything wrong because he's just sitting there. He's like, I did nothing wrong. And then she's like, stop, because she doesn't want to. I don't know if it's because she doesn't want to witness it or she couldn't live with the guilt or, you know, you're led to believe that Joseph pleading for his life was too much for her. And so she stops Potiphar and he's like, she's like, he doesn't deserve to die. And Potiphar's like, why? And she doesn't say anything. So then he realizes that his wife is unfaithful, um, attacked Joseph, lied about it, and um, almost caused him to lose his most valuable slave. Um, all because, like, she had to have some kind of story. Like, she was... Essentially what happened in, obviously in the, in the Bible, it takes a little bit more time, but in the film, basically what happened was she got angry. Uh, she screamed. Of course, the guards come running, they arrest Joseph and she has to have some type of explanation for what was going on. 
And so she told Potiphar her story. And then at the last minute, she's like, no, don't kill him. And then Potiphar realizes that he's been made a fool of by his own wife and that she is not faithful. That's a lot to swallow. And then when they're dragging, so he's like, take him to prison. And as they're dragging Joseph away, Joseph's like, master, please, I did nothing wrong. I would never betray you. And um, Potiphar knows he's telling the truth, but he has no choice but to send Joseph to prison because like the news of everything has already gotten around. Right. So now he has put he's what has essentially happened is for his reputation and his wife's reputation, he put Joseph in prison. Um, so Joseph, <laughs> Joseph goes to jail for a long time. Uh, he went from a clean shaven, fairly well fed slave to. He got fuzzy. He got very furry. Um but basically Potiphar had to make a decision. Either his wife's reputation was destroyed and his along with it, or he sent Joseph to jail and, you know, it was, he would be seen as like a merciful master, essentially. And you know, cause he only imprisoned him. He didn't kill him for what he did. So of course, because Joseph is a slave, they're going to let him take the fall. And he spends a lot of time in prison. And there's a really, this is actually one of the best scenes in the whole movie because he's angry at God, like right here. He's raging at God. He's really upset. Um, he's like, you've taken everything. Like, what did I do to deserve this? And he falls and you can't really see it too well, but there's a crack down here and there's this itty bitty tree that's trying to grow. And Joseph slips and he falls. And then he sort of like finds himself. He's, he's, um... He's like, okay, God, you know better than I do. Um, I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to care for this tree. I'm going to tend to this tree because it gives me something to do. And so as you know, Joseph's hair is growing out, he's getting thinner, but he's growing this tree and it's becoming stronger. You can see he's still got um, like the staff and, and the wrap around it because when he fell on it, it did damage it a bit, but he's been able to strengthen it up. And so he is... He's tending to this tree while he is in prison and it really helps him understand and appreciate like what it is that he has. Cause he's literally, this is a man who he went from miracle child to slave to favored slave to almost being executed for a crime he didn't commit to a prisoner. So he has been, he has been at the highest high and at the lowest low in his life many times now. And so he's realizing that, you know, certain things can be taken away, but it's his choice how he handles the situation and he, sh you know, understanding that he needs to put his faith in God, essentially, um, and to realize that there's, there's something more than than what the eye can see. Um, so he's in prison for a hot minute. When he gets there, there are other prisoners there. Gosh, darn it. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, look, there's the wolves. Very scary looking wolves too. Like genuinely scary looking wolves. <sighs> I'm getting really sick of this. Um, look, there's the tree. So Joseph's got, Joseph's got one heck of a beard. Um, and he's grown the tree out and this is right before he gets out of prison. Um, he, you know, it's, it's really amazing what he does, but when he gets to prison, there are two other slaves there. One is like this sort of bigger guy. And the other one was the skinny, like butler looking guy. And they've both had dreams and Joseph interprets those dreams. And so he lets the one man know that here we go. Here's the slaves. Assuming this actually loads. Um, he, so yeah, so he gets upset with Joseph and this other, and this other prisoner tries to, um, haul him off because Joseph has just interpreted this man's dream and 
been and said, in three days, Pharaoh's going to behead you and crows will feed on your flesh. And of course, that would be devastating for anybody to hear. And Joseph didn't want to interpret it at first, but he's like, you know what it is. Cause he interpreted this man's dream first and was like, in three days, um, Pharaoh will summon you and you will become, uh, a butler, a member of his household. And he's like, oh, and, you know, he's like, wouldn't that be the dream? And, you know, at first, Joseph, when he has to interpret this guy's dream, he's like, he's like, I don't know what it means. And they're like, no. He's like, yes, you do. Tell me. And then he threatens to, like, be, like, to punch Joseph unless Joseph tells him. So Joseph interprets his dream for him, and he does not take it well at all. He doesn't take it well. It's, it's not a good day. Um, I don't think anybody would take that news very well, essentially, um, obviously. So, yeah, see, this is, she's a bad lady. She's a bad lady. A very bad lady. Um, it's, he got, he was me too before it was a thing. Like, thousands of years before it was a thing. So, for anybody who says that women don't do this, Guys, it's in the freaking book of Genesis. Like, yeah. Yeah. This is this is how women destroy your life. This and and this was a straight up lie. Like he rejected her, he turned away. She's like, "Look at me." And he's like, "No. No, I will not betray my master. You know, you're not you shouldn't be here. You need to go." Um like he's rejecting her outright and she's actually more angry at his rejection. And she's like, she goes, everything you are, you owe to me because she brought him into the banquet hall and, um, you know, saved him from hard labor because he was doing hard labor when he got there. And she was like, come into the banquet hall. Well, then because he worked for her, he was able to save Potiphar from the thief and then, you know, built up from there. And she would talk about how impressed she was with Joseph's work around um, their home and everything and how well he had been doing for them. And so, um, she's trying to take credit for basically like, she didn't even buy him from the market, if that makes any sense. Um, but because she wanted him, she has this weird poisonous viewpoint that without her, Joseph would have never been noticed. And, um, would still be scrubbing floors with a rag, essentially. Um, and so is like trying to use that sort of influence and power and guilt to get him to sleep with her, for lack of a better word. So, um, yeah. And if he had slept with her, that would have also been punishable by death. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy just how the loop goes. But of all things, Potiphar shows up because Pharaoh has had a dream. And it's basically, it's followed by, he goes, he gets two dreams a night. Um, and one of them is there's seven ears of corn. Or, I can't remember. Dang it. Now I can't remember the dream exactly. Basically, so Pharaoh has a dream and it's, there's food and, and water and um, cattle and everything like that. And then Pharaoh wakes up and then he has a second dream. Um, and that one's got wheat and everything in it too. But in both of these dreams, it ends with like the, the Nile dries up and the, uh, grain becomes like sour and the cattle are dying. And then Joseph is like, Pharaoh's dreams are the same. And he explains that the seven ears of corn, the seven wheat stalks are seven years of plenty. And then it will be followed by seven years of famine and drought. That's why the Nile's drying up. That's why the wheat uh, the wheat becomes brittle and everything like that, and it won't grow. And it was um, after Potiphar comes and pulls him out of the dungeon, and they go up, and, and so they're like, "Well, what should we do?" And Joseph is like, we have to, you know, we have to store, like we have to harvest more than we normally, we have to sow more than we normally would, or, and then harvest more and then store the extras so that we will have um, rations for the seven years of famine. 
And sure enough, you know, like, so Pharaoh is like, he makes him the second man. Like he becomes number two in all of Egypt, all of Egypt. And Pharaoh says, he's like, only Pharaoh will be greater. So this is a huge thing. He went from being a slave to being second only to Pharaoh. And um, he basically, he, he saves Egypt. But he also ends up saving his family, that sold, his brothers who sold him into slavery. But um, he also meets, where'd she go? Ah, this is Osana. This is a good woman. This is Potiphar's niece. They get married and they have children. They flirt even when he was a slave. It was really sweet. She likes him because he's intelligent and sweet and, um, you know, caring. And she's she's sort of taken with him from the get-go. So here's Joseph as um, second to Pharaoh. And he's inspecting... He's inspecting the grain and the harvest and everything like that. And it's really good. It's really healthy. So he's happy to see that. Um, but then what ends up happening is the seven years of famine hit. But it doesn't just hit Egypt. It hits Canaan as well. And so when that happens, Joseph's brothers show up. Now, they don't recognize Joseph, obviously. Like, that's not what... That is not what they would expect to have happened to their brother, right? Um, so he recognizes them off the bat, though. And, you know, Potiphar is the one who is helping um, with the rations and, and such. Well, when Joseph recognizes them, uh, they're like, you know, they're talking to Potiphar. And they're like, we'll pay you with silver. And Joseph has flashbacks to how they sold him into slavery for that bag of silver. Like they've held onto that silver this whole time. And so Potiphar's like, okay, very well, we will give you. And then Joseph comes out of nowhere and he's like, nothing. And then he accuses them of being spies or thieves. Um, and he's he arrests one of his brothers until they produce their youngest brother, Benjamin, who would be Joseph's full brother. And so they agree. And while, um, while one of his brothers is in prison, he shouts up and he's like, my brothers will come for me, which was exactly what Joseph said when the slavers were capturing him. Of course, he didn't realize that his brothers were the ones that had sold him into slavery. So they go, they get the youngest brother, they bring him back. Um, and Joseph's like, well, clearly you weren't lying and everything seems right as rain, except Joseph is going to get his payback. He sets the youngest brother up. He slides, so he gives them all grain. Here it is. I knew I'd seen it. He gives them all grain. And um, as they're leaving, he stops them. He has them arrested. And he's like, one of you is stolen from me. And they're like, we'd never do that. Well, then he's slicing the bags and whatnot. Well, when he gets to Benjamin, who is, you would have thought that the parent, that they would have learned. Um, but no, they set Benjamin apart too, but they treated him ex exceptionally. What Like they didn't let him go out like at all. They didn't want what happened to Joseph to happen to him because they believed you know, the brothers went back with Joseph's coat that they had dipped in sheep's blood, ram's blood and brought it to their, brought it to um, their father and been like, this was all we found. So they believe their, their child is dead. And they didn't want the same thing to happen to Benjamin. Well, then you find out that Benjamin's mother has already passed away. And so now the their father is, of course, excessive, like is excessively protective and is doing the same thing with Benjamin that he did with Joseph. But the brothers, you find out after Joseph cuts open Benjamin's bag and says, you'll be punished. And all of his brothers are like, no, take me, please take me, take me. Because, and then Judah says, our brother was not killed by wolves. We were blinded by slavery or blinded by jealousy and sold him into slavery. And we've lived with that guilt for 20 years. And they're like, our father could not survive it. And um, 
you know, Joseph realizes that they've been suffering too. Granted, not as much because they weren't sold into slavery. But he realizes that they're regretful and remorseful and he um, forgives them and they have this really sweet sort of like reunion. And then, of course, Benjamin's like, Joseph, like my 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 brother Joseph, who I was told was murdered by wolves. Um, and so we get this really nice family reunion. Now, book of Genesis and book of Exodus are both in the Old Testament. So here are, because, you know, he's got the 12 tri- These are the, these are Canaan's. They're from Canaan. They're, they're Hebrews. They're coming to Egypt and they were, a, they were at first seen as equals. That did not remain the case, as we all know, because... Um, Moses and Exodus happened, but yes, so we, we get, yep, the 12 tribes, exactly, Raj. So unfortunately it was not, it was not meant to remain as happy, but it's, yeah. Yeah. It's just sad because you know where the story is going. Like, we end up at the first movie of this month, which is, of course, Prince of Egypt. Um, But, yeah, so they get to have this big happy family reunion. Um, It's really sweet. The music in this is fantastic. There's some real classics in here. Um, You Know Better Than I is one of my favorites. Um, Miracle Child was really good. just oh man there's so there the the soundtrack to this is really soulful it's really good um and and it it just i wish dreamworks had stuck to this because they were knocking them out of the park for sure this was this was good stuff oh iron fist hi sorry i couldn't make the stream I'd love to make them all, but you know how it is. I do know how it is. No, I hope I haven't having a good week. I hope you have too. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, there. So the story has a happy ending, but of course, the twelve tribes eventually become it in slit. Like you know, they were the reason at first it was they were working together because they they knew how to work the land. They were good farmers. They 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 were fishermen. They were shepherds they were farmers and then that slowly evolved into the egyptians turning them into slaves um but the music in this is fantastic um dreamworks really knew what they were doing when they uh when they put these together the visuals are breathtaking here here's when the tree is really, really little, there's one leaf left. And so Joseph is tending to the tree. Um, there's lots of the overall lesson and takeaways, of course, family and forgiveness, um, and, and not falling into the trap of jealousy and envy and to appreciate the gifts that God have given, has given you. That's, that's sort of the overarching theme. Um, but there's so many other lessons throughout this film as well. Um, Potiphar's wife, for example, like, you know, that if you know the character of a man, um, you should perhaps question when something so egregious is what they're being accused of. It went when something like that happens. So there's, I mean, there's that lesson in there. There's lessons of true love, um, of understanding your value as a human being. Um, it's, it's, oh man, there's, oh, it's, so, there's so many good lessons, like the value of a hard day's work, um, appreciating the ability, like something that I don't think a lot of people take away from this. One of the things that Joseph could do that his brothers couldn't was read. Um, he could read and write, which was very rare for, um, anyone 
back in that time. And his brothers probably knew how to read basic things and write basic things. But Joseph could not only read and write Hebrew, but he could read and write Egyptian. So he was very intelligent. And he was very well educated. Um, and that's something that we definitely take for granted today. Like the fact that probably almost, if not all of you listening to this stream right now, have the ability to read that is that would have been unheard of back in this day um but it's it's just i don't know there's there's so much hope and so much inspiration in this entire film and you know, not to sound super corny. Oh, here we go. Not to sound super duper corny, but you know, it teaches you the power of love and sticking by your principles and doing what's right, even in difficult circumstances. So it's, it's, it's shocking when you think of how far we've come and, and, and just how appreciative you, you can really be with all of it. So if you guys have not seen Joseph King of Dreams, um, I highly recommend it. It is, it is an exceptional film. It's, it's fun. It's, the music is great. The soundtrack is fantastic. The cast is, the, the cast is extremely talented. Very, very well done. Um, ben Affleck gives a fantastic performance in this. Um, and I think it's, I'm trying, I think it's, I got to look, hang on. James Eckhouse is Potiphar, is the voice actor for Potiphar. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, so yeah, so We've got James Eckhouse does a fantastic job as Potiphar. Um, and there's, there's just, there is a lot here to love. Um, and, and the story itself is pretty timeless and, and just reminds you that no matter how far you fall, just keep pushing, keep working, and, you know, you can't overcome it, and you have to just look at what it is that is with, you know, when, when Joseph was in prison, the only thing he had was the tree, and so he just worked on pouring himself into that tree, and making that tree stronger, and better, and this was something that was in his control, he couldn't control that he was in prison, he couldn't control, um, that he was accused of a crime he didn't commit, and he couldn't control when he was going to get out of there, if ever. But he could control how well he took care of this tree. And so, you know, the whole song that happens during this scene, which is You Know Better Than I, is it hits hard for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think when when you sit back and you realize just what, everything that he went through and, and why he is where he is. And the fact that it's not that he's happy about where he is. It's not that he doesn't want to get out and it's not that he wouldn't try to get out if the opportunity presented itself, but he has accepted where he is and is doing what he can with what he has. Um, but there's there's just so much to love. Oh, Raj, I'm glad. Yes, Tale of Two Cities. It's going to be great. That's for our book club next month. Next, uh, it's the 20, I'm going to misspeak, 25th. Yeah, 25th of June. So, um, but anyway, um, it's just... It's just fantastic. And I think the big difference that we see with these movies compared to what what is coming out now 
is there's no hope in any of the films coming out now. It's very nihilistic. It's very hopeless. It's it's very, there is no point to anything, so why bother? Which is, you know, heartbreaking in its own right, because there's... There's something to be said for a story that doesn't have the resolution you were hoping for, because... Life is full of disappointment, but the thing is, when you're in escapism, um, especially when you're talking about, you know, faith and God and deliverance and um, having, having the ability to trust in what you can't understand or you can't see or you, is, is just, is, it's outside of your grasp, um, it it really lets you know that there is there's something there that you can pour yourself into and and be a part of and i think that's a really important message that we just don't hear enough nowadays because it's come to the point now where people are insulted if they you know at the idea that um what do you mean that I have to be subservient or what do you mean I have to give up what I want? Or what do you mean that I have to, I can't just have this because I, you know, for virtue of wanting it. Um, And those are all lessons that are being reinforced today. And those are really, really dangerous lessons. And I think this film particularly shows that just because you're on top of the world does not make you a good person. Um, And that can all be taken away. I mean, Joseph's whole life got taken away by a lie because she was a woman who was married to, um, she was a woman who was married to a man in power. And, um, you know, his, like I said, his reputation was on the line. His wife's reputation was on the line. And so it was easier to destroy a man's life than to allow the truth to be free. Um, and, you know, Potiphar went through guilt and, and it's not until you find out that his wife has, has since died. You're not sure how you don't like in the film, you you don't, it doesn't explain it. Um, but when he shows up, he, he goes, Pharaoh has requested to see you. And Joseph is like, uh, you know, he goes, oh. And Potiphar stops and he goes, I just, my wife, and then Joseph puts his hand on Potiphar's shoulder and he's like, I understand. And Joseph, you realize, at while he'd been in prison, rather than letting it turn him bitter and rather than letting it turn him faithless and, and callous, he, he gave into forgiveness and understanding and recognizing that whatever God's plan was, he couldn't, even with his gifts, he couldn't see everything that God had planned. And then when it unfolded, it made sense because not only, you know, if he had never been, if Joseph had never been sold into slavery, he never would have gone to Egypt. If he'd never gone to Egypt, he never would have um, gone to Potiphar's house. And if he hadn't been in Potiphar's house, he wouldn't have um, been accused of that crime and put in prison where he met that other uh, prisoner who eventually became Pharaoh's butler. And then he would have never been able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And then all of Egypt and Canaan and everywhere that was touched by the famine um, and drought would have died. So the root cause of like, even though he couldn't see God's hand moving and he couldn't understand why he was being put through the trials and the, and the pain and the torture and the slavery and being ripped away from everything that he knew and having his life destroyed twice. Um, even though he couldn't see it, he, all of that brought him to where he was to the point where people knew his character, people knew what his gifts were, people knew what he was capable of, and he was able to save Egypt and his family because of it. So it's, it's just a fascinating lesson about how if you continue to persevere and you push through and you have faith and you have hope and you believe that giving yourself over to this idea that there's something greater than yourself and you pour into what you can control, then 
anything is possible and you will arrive at a destination better than where your struggles have landed you because you know character is forged in struggle and and you know if you never have any what how's it go if you never have anything to overcome you're never going to learn how to persevere you're never gonna know how to be something stronger if that makes sense so this film does a really good job of that the story itself is fantastic um from the bible and and um i just i really encourage you to watch the film if you haven't and if you have go back and give it a watch because it's, it's definitely worth it it's it's very well told um let's see i don't i don't see any more donations or super chats um so real quick because we've hit an hour we're gonna do honorable mentions and then we will tap out for the evening um like yeah you know like you guys know i try and keep these to an hour hour and 15. um so first and foremost so we're just gonna go down the line um so first up is the sword and the stone and i love this film i think that it's and, and these are just honorable mentions guys but this by no means covers all of them um, for those of you who are unaware, this is the Arthurian legend um, adaptation where and we get Merlin and we get Meg and we get Arthur as a young boy. And um, he pulls a scalibur from the stone. But this is another story like he was mistreated. He was he was mocked um, and he's. He, he was, I mean, the dogs got treated better than he did, honestly. Um, but then he becomes this symbol of eternal hope. And, um, you know, it's, it's, he pulls Excalibur from the stone and all of these men are just in awe because none of them could budge this sword. Um, so it's, yeah, th this is, this is a fantastic um, animated film. They, it, it, it the story, the animation, it's, it's just fantastic. Um, it, you know, it's the classic Arthurian legend, but it's got a little bit of comedy. It's got some magic. It's got some music. Um, and it's, it's fabulous. Um, the, like the story itself is great. Um, Archimedes the Owl if, is my favorite out of this movie. Um, I love Archimedes. So give this one a watch if you haven't. I would give this one, and this is, and unfortunately we are going to be doing some throwbacks to Disney, but um, I would probably give this like an 8.8 .8 out of 10, honestly. It's really good. Next up is Robin Hood. This one is another fantastic classic animated film um, from the from disney's better days they're not what they used to be i will say that um but this film again hopeful he's sort of a scoundrel um that they just have they just have fun they're two best friends that have fun and then he falls for a girl and you know they end up saving everyone um the sheriff of nottingham is a fantastic bad guy um the music in this is great. The animation is fantastic. The story is uh, just, it, somehow it's all over the place and yet makes sense. It's, it's just wonderful the way that it, it works. Um, I, I absolutely love it. Um, the, the music is fantastic. I can't think of the rooster's name. Oh no. Anyway, I love him. He's great. Fabulous. Um, no, uh, like no honorable mentions list would be complete without the iron giant. This film is a Warner brothers film, I believe. And it is just freaking phenomenal. Um, it's, oh man, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I cried. I'm pretty sure I cried when I watched this. It's, it's just fabulous. Um, and suit like 
You know, it's really sad. What's really sad is when Warner Brothers does Superman better in a movie with a giant steel robot than in their own Superman movies. Like, I realize that it's DC and AT&T and everything like that, but, like, Warner Brothers is just... I, like, how does Warner Brothers get it so right in this and then get it so wrong on other things? I just... I am confused. I am confuzzled it makes no sense it makes no sense um uh iron fist yeah robin hood was right there so we've got robin hood sword in the stone iron giant uh road to el dorado uh dream another dreamworks one this one almost this one almost replaced titan ae last week um el dorado this this one is freaking fantastic um it would be look Calgy. i wanted to okay chris Persh. i know i know i know don't worry many of these will be getting their own nostalgic nirvana but like there's there's only so there's only four thursdays in a month this was hard okay it may or may not have come to pulling names out of a hat i'm gonna be perfectly honest with you guys it was hard to do um it was really difficult. There's some great animated films out there. Um, for real. Uh, Balto is an guys. I don't know if you've not if you've seen this or not, it's fantastic. There's oh man, I didn't know I could love them. Like, I love dogs. I love dogs so much. And I love snow. But I did not know that I could love a movie about sled dogs and snow as much as I do. Like, just wow. Um I, I love this movie. It's so fantastic. Uh, the animation is great. The, the, oh my gosh, the tension in this movie. Like, are they going to make it in time to save the children? Is, is she going to be able to, um, hold out and, and, you know, not fall victim to this bully right here? Um, you've never heard of Balto Raj? Oh my god, y'all go watch this movie. It's freaking phenomenal. Um I I think there's like sequels, but I don't really care about those. This movie is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. If you've not seen Balto, go watch it. They so it's the sled dogs, it's the um Iditarod. This is where the Iditarod came from. It's the race to get the medicine to the children because the only way that they can do it is by sled dog. Um and, and there's just so much tension and drama and, um, just like real, the, the, the music is, is fantastic. The score is amazing. Um, but it's so, yes, Eric K, it is based on a true story. Absolutely. Um, and, and that makes it all the better. Raj, if you can get your hand, like, get your hands on this movie, it's it's wonderful. Um, like really, truly amazing. Um, the Aristocats. Ah, I love this one. So everybody wants to be a cat because the cat's the only cat who knows where it's at. Oh man. Remember when music was fantastic? Um, yeah, yeah. Aristocats is where it's at. It's so, it's so good. Um, the animation, the music, the story, um, you know, it, I, guys, this is, this is worth a watch. It's, it's got a lot to do with, um, greed, misunderstanding, um, envy. There's, there's a lot to love here. Um, Aristocats is, it's a good one. Uh, yes, Raj, get it. Get Balto. It's so good. Oh my gosh, Iron Fist, you need to watch it. Balto was fantastic. It, it, we don't deserve dogs. And that movie is further proof that we just simply do not deserve dogs. This is, this movie is more proof of how fantastic dogs are. Um, but yes, the Aristocats, it's the music, the story, it's fun, it's upbeat, it's heartfelt. Um, and you're cheering for them the whole way through. So... Yeah, it's just a good time. 
the page master. Oh, guys, if you have not seen the page master, now this is not a fully animated, Balto's not fully animated either, like the intro and the outro um, are not. So like if you start watching Balto Raj and you're like, hey, this isn't animated, it, it bleeds into animation much like the page master does. Um, this is a phenomenal story. The way that they're able to weave in and out of these different well-known um, fairy tales. You've got Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, um, Moby Dick. And then of course you've got it like what, like what fantasy movie would be complete without a dragon. And this dragon is terrifying by the way. Oh my God, Cal G, what do you mean the, you don't know what the page man, go find it. Go find the page master right now. It's so good. So, so, so good. Um, it really shows you the power of your imagination and, and what a library, how valuable libraries are and, and the depth that you can go to when you are, when you allow yourself to escape into these different worlds. It's so fantastic. And what's really great is, um, he starts out as, he starts out as sort of this like worry wart, very shy, doesn't want to do anything too out. Like he's, a, he, he, he doesn't even want his dad to go up a ladder because of these different, um, these different accidents that can happen on a ladder. It, there's, there's so much, there's so much character growth and, and depth and, and intrigue in this story. We get, Oh my gosh, you get Treasure Island in here too. Like there's, and of course, you know, you get the wizard. The, I, guys, I can't, I cannot recommend this movie enough. It is a fantastic watch. It really, really is. Um, yeah, give this one a watch if you've not. It, it's good. Uh, the Secret of Nim. So this, this is a good one. I don't know why this was ever shown to small children because it's absolutely terrifying, but it's so good. It is based on the book, The Secret of Nim. It, it's a Don Bluth production, um, which he was involved with Titan AE. Like, I, I'm telling you guys, this is, this is some world-class storytelling and animation. Um, it's so good and it's so underrated. The, it, it follows, you know, it's, I don't know how much of this I want to give away because out of all of them, um, I really think you guys need to see this one because it, it's about courage. It's about overcoming. It's about, um, you know, the, the bonds of family and, 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 and I mean, look at like, you've got an owl, a cat and, a, and I mean, he looks kind of silly, but like, look at this. Look at that. Like, she's going up against some heavy-duty hitters. And then you find out what the secret of Nim is. And you're like, whoa. That's actually, like, really dark. Like, wow. And, yeah. You're, you're like, you're just like, dude, that's not what I don't. Like, when I, I remember when I watched this movie, I don't know what I was expecting. It was not that. <laughs> I was like, whew, that hits different. So yeah, if you guys can watch The Secret of Nim, highly recommend it. It's great around Halloween time too. It's great anytime, but it's really good around Halloween time. Um, it's a very scary movie. I don't care what anybody says. Yes, yes, Chrysanth. Scared me as a kid too. Scares me still. It's, it's really, really, really scary. These films are your entire childhood. Well, I am glad. Um, that I can bring, this is nostalgic Nirvana after all. And I haven't even, guys, I've only done, you know, like, I think I've got not, hang on, two, four, six, eight. I've got nine. There's so many more. Um, the last one that I have is Anastasia. So I think Disney now owns this film, sadly. Um, but it was not originally a Disney film. And they successfully squashed this film when it came out, but it is so good. It's, of course, the story of the Romanov princess who they believe survived Rasputin. You want to talk about a soundtrack? Holy crap. Anastasia's soundtrack is just on a different, like, 
a whole different level. It's just wow. Um, the I, I I love this movie. It's so good. It's so good. Um, okay, like one. I'll do one more. Hold on. You guys can probably see me typing it in, but I don't care. Oliver and Company. I love this movie so much. The music is great. The, I mean, animation is great. I love <laughs> Tino. Oh man, there's there's something special about this. Um, and and like this whole the it, the fact that you know he's a stray, he gets adopted by a little girl, and then he gets he gets kidnapped. Um, on accident, you know, and, and you realize that they're just like the homeless guy that they all run with is just trying to survive. Um, so it's really an interesting story about, are you a villain because of circumstances or are you a villain by choice? Because there's a main villain in this too. And he actually kidnaps Oliver's owner, um, for ransom. And, and the whole, and you know, Oliver gets to be a hero. There's, there's so much, um, good stuff here. Um, I don't know. This one's, this one is another personal favorite. And, um, you know, oh man, see, I got to think for dogs. Like, I just love the puppies. Um, oh, I can't believe I didn't have this on here. Um, don't. Don't shame me, okay? Here, we'll do this one. No, not all dogs go to heaven, too. Get out of here with your nonsense. Ah, there you are. All dogs go to heaven. Here's a... And it's, of course, it's a Don... Man, I'm not even realizing... I'm just picking Don Bluth films at this point. Like, um... It's... Ah, oh, this is a good one. Um... Yes, it is like all that's why it's it's Oliver and Company, Oliver Twist. Yeah, it's their um it's theirs. Oh my gosh, yes, Fievel. Ah, Fievel goes west. I, yes, see, so much good stuff. Um, but yeah, so you've got all dogs go to heaven. This one is a lot of fun. The crocodile always weirded me out. Um, but this has a very this is a very um very dark themes. Like, you legit see hell in this movie. So, I mean, you get to see heaven, but, like, you also see hell. It's pretty freaking terrifying. I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah, we'll do five. We'll, go, we'll do five really quick. Um, oops. I like Five Goes West. I know that there's Five Goes to America or whatever. American Tale, that's what it is. So, you've got... This one, Five Goes West. Um, this one was my favorite. I'm trying to remember. I think the first one is just an American tale. Um, yeah. So this is when they're coming from, this is when they're going to America, obviously. Like, they're on the boat, and they're trying to get to America. Uh, and then you have American Tale, Five Goes West. This, like, one of the few sequels that I think may have even, um, surpassed its predecessor honestly it, it did fan i think i think it just did absolutely fantastic and it really you know this it showed the story of immigrants really really well um and sort of what they went through the hardships but it did it from a point of view where kids could watch and be intrigued and sort of understand um and so it it, it never had to get political or anything like that um to really I don't know. <sighs> to tell its story, basically. Um, Fantasia. Okay. Well, I, I already gave Disney quite a few deals tonight. They used to be good. They used to be good. And then they, whoa. I don't know who that is. Apparently there's a woman named Fantasia. Okay. Bye. There's the Fantasia we're looking for. That was not the Fantasia we were looking for. This is the Fantasia we are looking for. Um, 
So Fantasia has actually not changed the it's been digitally remastered and re-recorded, but the story, the animation, and the soundtrack. Um, they, they're, they've all stayed the same over these many years. And it's a great story. It really is a great story. Um, she's an R&B singer. Okay, well, learn something new every day. I did not know that. Um, oh, man. Did you guys ever see the three caballeros? Hang on. The three caballeros. Click. I love this movie. It's so good. You get the collection, so you get different stuff in there. Very politically incorrect. Would not be made today. That's okay, though. I really love it. If you guys can get your hands on this, you're in for a treat. It's a good one. Um, but there's lots. There's so much. But see, guys, like... Even just going, like, we've cleared, we, we've gone down this insane list. Um, and there's still so much more out there to love. I didn't even touch on all of it. Um, but you've got all of these fantastic stories to share and to watch. Some of you for the first time. I can't believe some of you haven't heard of The Page Master or Balto. Like, that floors me. These were some of my favorite films as a kid. I mean, you're in for a treat. And again, it's, it's Don Bluth does an amazing job with a lot of, I mean, the secret of Nim and, um, I think Faye, you were the one that pointed it out. Yeah. This was a Fox property and then Disney got a hold of it when they, um, uh, acquired Fox. So guys, there's just, there's so much out there to love and enjoy and don't let the fact that it's classically animated stop you. Um, there's, there's a lot out there to love, um, and, and to enjoy and clear, like, you know, you guys haven't, there's a lot out there that I've never seen. Um, but this, this is just kind of a good reminder that there's always something out there to be discovered. Um, and it's, oh my gosh, Faye, you're right. rock -a doodle Yes. That was another one of my favorites. Hold on. Did you guys ever see this? Rockadoodle. He loses his confidence in being a rooster. And why were the owls always... You guys notice that? The owls were evil a lot when we were kids. The owls were the, the, owls were the bad guys. Um, but yeah, Rockadoodle, man. This was great. Oh! Oh! Something else that's in this same vein. Um, oh, not move. Do, do, do. There we go. Did you guys ever see this? We're back. Oh, this is a good one. Um, this is a good one. I, I highly underrated. Um, this is such a good film. But yeah, between Rockadoodle and We're Back. Um, oh, man. This has got some really dark stuff in it, too. Um, Owls are just evil by nature, I think. I don't know. The animated films definitely made them evil, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, this is this is a good one, guys. If you've ever if you've never seen it, We're Back is really good. Oh, um, oh, we're just we're just gonna go down. We're going down the line. We're going down the line. Thumbelina. This is another great one. I love it. True, the owl was not the bad guy in the secret of him. <laughs> he was just terrifying. Um, but, um, yes, someone else has seen it. It's such a good movie. Yeah, Alien Dinosaurs. I mean, yeah, kind of. Um, oh, Christine the Killer Car. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, all the love and support, you guys. I, I, it means the world to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um... Yes, it's John Goodman. I am like 85% sure. Um, absolutely, yes. Oh, Chris Persia. Yes. Yes. Holy crap, did that really come out in 1988? Wow. Why can't I click you? Why are you being rude? Okay. Oh, from the creators of American Tales. No wonder it's fantastic. 
Uh, Don Bluth, and there's Lucas and Spielberg again. But, yeah, it's a Don Bluth film, guys. Um, let's see. Can I blow that one up? Yes, I can. And James Horner on the music again. Just like we had uh, – do, 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 do. was it Secret of Nim? Yeah, James Bluth. Horner, where are you at? I know you're in here somewhere. Ah, with the Page Master. Yes. And then, of course, Balto, James Horner. And I believe Balto is also a, a Bluth production as well. So there's – Don Bluth and James Horner. I'm crisscrossing their names, but yeah. Um, yeah, Lamb Before Time has a lot of sequels, but this initial one is really good and heart-wrenching. Um, it's This is the first one, and it's really, really good. Sharp Tooth! Um, but yeah, it's, it's great. I think out of all these films, I think The Iron Giant is the one that made me cry. I don't know how you couldn't, though. Like, when... When you go to the scene and it's, you are who you choose to be. And then he closes his eyes and he's like, Superman. Like, oh my God. Warner Brothers, what are you doing? Just, just make Superman, but the Iron, make Iron Giant, but have it be the Superman movie. Like, literally. Literally. My Lord in heaven. You got it so right. I don't know where you went wrong. Ridiculous. Um, but yeah, guys, there's so, so, so much out there to love. Um, don't let the fact that it's an animated film stop you from enjoying it. There's there's a ton, a ton of things out there for us to enjoy. Oh my God, Christine the Killer Car. Thank you for becoming a member at the Ocarina level. I, I, I am eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. As okay, I still cry when I watch Iron Giant. I got you, Chrysanth. I understand. I understand. Uh, I think they may have had a, an animated series. You're right. But I know they had a lot of sequels. I want to say they had like nine sequels. Um, but yeah, guys. So just keep in mind that there is so much out there for you to enjoy, to find, to rediscover, to discover for the first time. Um, you, you don't have to be beholden to um, what is currently, what the current thing is. There's so much out there to love. This is called Nostalgic Nirvana for a reason. And I would not, none of these would be on this list. I wouldn't have spent an, a whole month on these films if, you know, if I, if I didn't love them. These are all things, these are all films that I have watched multiple times um, and that I absolutely love. I, I, I can't recommend these any higher. It's, there's the stories, the animation, the talent that's, I mean, the, like the, the talent that's on screen, of course, with the animation and everything, the hand-drawn talent, but then of course, uh, you've got the voice talent. There's so much here to love. Um, and, and the stories are timeless. So I really hope that you guys give this and all of those from the list and more a chance. I'm really shocked that some of you haven't heard of Balto and, um, you know, that, that really surprises me. Secret of Nim as well. Those were, those were some of my favorites growing up. Um, but I, I just, yeah, I, I can't recommend any of those movies higher and highly enough. So I want to thank everybody for coming by tonight. I know we went a little bit long. I went 90 minutes. Um, so I hope you all have a fantastic evening. I will be doing a stream at some point tomorrow with, uh, Stieg, we're going to go over our five underrated actors in movies. Um, and we're going to talk about that. So that should be an interesting stream too. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of, uh, I've got a lot of work to do on a few videos over the weekend. So, um, this was, this was a lot, a lot of fun guys. Um, Joseph King of Dreams is a great film. It's a great story. 
Um, I recommend reading it in the Bible as much as I do watching the show. Um, that'll be here on my channel, Iron Fist. Um, Steve doesn't like doing stuff on his channel, but that's okay. We love him anyway. Um, I really hope that you guys are enjoying these streams as much as I am. Like, even just going through the honorable mentions list was fantastic. And I know, like, all of those films pretty much deserve a nostalgic Nirvana stream on their own. Unfortunately, I only had four Thursdays in May. Um, so it's, it's going to be, you know, guys, I'm looking forward to next month as well. Um, and, and hopefully these get you in the mood to watch something really great and to remember that entertainment was meant to entertain and you are not beholden to what the current thing is. So um, I appreciate every single one of you being here. I hope you have a fantastic night or day, depending where you're at in the world. Um, oh, and I have my Sailor Moon stream Thir uh, this weekend as well with Lethal on my channel. So don't miss that either. Um, if you guys want to talk some really great manga and anime. But uh, much love to you all. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your evening or day. Um, God bless and Godspeed.